Hi, I'm Janet Ayers and Jim Steele from the General's Quarters Restaurant in the Locust Grove Town Center. And we proudly support TV18 and we love life around the lake. This is the crew from the Flower Cottage. We are excited to support TV18. We love life around the lake. Hi, this is Norm Allen with you on another version of Meet Your Neighbor right here at Lake of the Woods. And we're certainly glad that you've decided to join us today. As always, we always have intriguing and interesting stories about people who live around you. You never know what they're going to be doing. And this guy, Ken Wilson, does some very interesting things. And we're going to talk about winemaking today and uh, life around the lake and just all kinds of cool things. So I thank you for being a part of the show today. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Well, well now you've been busy all morning. I have. Well, when we start talking about making wine, I, I think about getting a big bu bucket and a jug and saying, okay, let's kind of make some wine and just whatever comes out, comes out. But there's a whole lot more to it than that. There sure is. Um, we work with, uh, we volunteer at Northgate Vineyards. and up Where those, at, Where's that located? It's up in Percival, Loudoun County. Okay. And um, side note, that's the first winery that I've ever built. And, um, well, let's go back and, and let's jump on that right quick. Cause, okay. Because that's something that you do outside of your own hobby of making wine. You do something way bigger than that, don't you? Right. My, uh, I own a small construction company with my partner, uh, Jose. And um, we build, uh, we, we have a niche now and we build wineries. Uh, we've, this is, we've done three. We're starting our fourth one in a couple of weeks. And then we've got uh, a couple more on the, you know, that, we're, that we're estimating and, and bidding on. Now, when we say building a winery, are, is this something that has to do with the craft where you're building the, the containers that go in it and the whole thing, or, or is, is it from ground up? From ground up, uh, we, we build the tasting room, we build the production facility, we build a barrel room. Uh, there's very meticulous uh, specifications that you need, to, you, know, to, you need to keep. Wine likes constant temperature, cold temperature, so we have to design barrel rooms and uh, the production facilities to be at... 59 degrees when it's 105 degrees outside. So wine oh. cellar is really a wine cellar. Right, but we don't do a cellar. We do it above ground, so we insulate it really, really well and have real high-efficiency um, high equipment. And um, in the barrel rooms, we have, to, we have to put a lot of humidification in so that the wine doesn't evaporate because evaporating wine is evaporating wine and profits. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a true. bad thing. That's a bad thing. Are they all the same then? I mean, if you're building four wine, do you do them the same way? Is every specification the same? The general specs are the same, the criteria, um, but the different, different sizes, different layouts, different building materials we've done where they're like a clean room where we use this material, this, this trust core material, which is very antimicrobial, very white, very hospital-like. Um, and then we also have done barrel rooms where it looks like the inside of a church. And so it's all, all wood and heavy timber, and they hold events in there, and they're drop-dead gorgeous. So we have utilitarian ones, plus we have ones that, are, that will serve many purposes. Well, when we mentioned barrel rooms, and that's, let's talk about barrels a little bit, because we're going to be talking about that <clears throat> as, as we get into the winemaking process. How important is a, a Wine in barrels. We've all seen it on television, but that's a whole nother science, isn't it? It is, because there's there's French oak barrels, there's Hungarian, there's American oak, there's different kind of toasts that you can do, which which impact the flavor of the wine. Um, new barrels add more flavor quicker. As barrels get to about six or seven years of age, they're pretty much become neutral barrels. So then it just lets the, the wine oxidize in the barrels. So if you hear at a winery that it's in a neutral barrel, that just means it's in an older barrel and it's really not adding any flavor. It's just letting it breathe. It's just a place to put the wine. Mm -hmm. And let it breathe. Okay. Now in your case, because we've, we've already seen where we're doing wine in your garage, in your Correct. factory here. In our factory, yes. <laughs> Now, that didn't start out as something you just read about. You really went through some meticulous training to get to know how to do that, right? Correct. Um, all started in, I guess, 2007. I went to, uh, my wife and I and my daughter went on a German trip, and we met Mark and Vicky Fedor, the, the owners at, at Northgate. And at, in 2007, I could tell the difference between a red wine and a white wine because of color. I had no idea about varietals. And, uh, but they were winemakers. 
and they were doing it in their garage, and they were just getting ready to get started. And so they, they asked if I wanted to help. And so Sharon and I went over, and we helped bottle, and they gave us wine as a thank you. And then the next spring, did we want to plant? And they said, we said, sure, and they gave us wine. And then we picked, and they gave us wine. And we <laughs> bottled, and they gave us wine. And we pressed, and they gave us wine. And then in 2009, they wanted to build their own facility, and they asked me to, to build it. And so in 2010, instead of getting bottles of wine, I asked if they could teach me how to make wine. So I made five gallons of Merlot and five gallons of Cab Franc, and I had no idea what I was doing. And he just gave me little baggies of yeasts and nutrients and chemicals and stuff and said, do this, do this, do this, and take a, take a bunch of notes. Now, this is also all from Virginia grapes. All from Virginia grapes, all grown. Actually, it was all grown on Northgate's property, so it's Northgate Estate, estate grapes. Now, we, we start talking about all the different things that you use, the yeast and the nitrite or sulfites. Sulfites, yeah. And some other things. We look at a wine label right now, and you can see all those on there. I don't know what they mean. Is that important for me to know what those things are? The sulfites are a preservative, and um, most of your larger, you know, California wineries that ship it across the country, they will put the max in, which is 150 parts per million, and it's to protect the wine. Uh, as local, where you keep it locally around here, I only put about 50 parts per million in, so I don't have as long a shelf life. But the the trade-off is you don't get headaches. A lot of people get wine headaches, and that's the sulfites. Uh, my wife is, is a prime example of that, but um, she can drink my wine all day long and not get a headache. <laughs> Sorry, hon. The experiment will be going on later on this <laughs> afternoon. We'll be trying that out to see that. That's correct. So, real, so that's the, it's not the red that's doing it. It's the sulfites. It's the, it's the sulfites, headaches. yes. Does it change the flavor of the wine? No. You no. can't tell it's there. You can't tell it's there. It's so, it's so, they're so minimal. Um, it's, I mean, the, the, the sulfur dioxide is, is pretty potent smelling when you're mixing it up and stuff. You don't want to inhale it because it will make uh, your eyes water really Now, when hot. we think of, but you say it's for preservation, when I think of preservation, what about all these aged bottles of wine that are 100 years old and those kind of things? Some of the old French wines and Italian wines, they don't have sul or si uh, nitrites in those, do they? Or sulfites? No clue. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have no idea. Um, so what are we preserving it from? What ruins a wine? Bacteria. Bacteria, air, um, but mostly, mostly bacteria. So, I mean, of course there's going to be bacteria because that's just what the world's made of, right? Correct, right. So we, but we try and limit it. You know, when in, in, in this, there's just a little bit of headspace that air can get, get into. Commercial wineries will, will more... Fill that with nitrogen as as they're as they're bottling it through the bottling the, the bottling line. Um, we don't because I don't have right. nitrogen. So, sure. but our, my wine will only last four or five years. Where older wines will, you know, the, 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 ha. how can, how can you tell when a wine goes bad? The, the taste, the smell. Um, okay. It'll it won't it won't smell fruity. It won't smell wine. It'll smell more vinegary, um, and it'll. It'll taste like crap. <laughs> and then it can be used for cooking and those kind of things, though, after that, can't you? I think so, yeah. I, no, I've never had wine go long enough to go bad that I've had to do that. So we, 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 we're good at drinking it. Okay. so Yes, we are. <laughs> we certainly are. So we've, we've gone now. We know what we're doing. We've gone to get fruit from here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. You've brought it home. What's the next steps? So um, as I've gotten more involved in the, in the wine, um, Different yeasts have different characteristics. They bring out different characteristics of the grapes. Um, some may bring a more fruity flavor to it or, or, or more of a nose. Some will actually help with the structure of the wine. Some will help on the finish of the wine. And so I, I will take um, the grapes that I get and break it into two or three smaller batches and then put a, a yeast, a different yeast in each one, let it, let it ferment, let it age, separate, and then at the end, blend it all together so that it, it helps make the wine a little bit more complex. So that's what those blue numbers are that are on the jugs out there. To correct. Tell you what kind of yeast that you've used in this Correct, correct. Do, does, do, if you use different yeast, do they require a different amount of fermentation time? No, it's all, it's all the same. The process to hydrate the yeast, because it comes, 
dried, and so you you put you put uh, you put it in 104 degree water, and you let it sit for 15 minutes, and then you kind of cool it by adding some of the the grape the must into it, and then you and then introduce it into the into the into the now this yeast because we use Fleischmann's yeast to make bread correct, and then we use a brewer's yeast to make beer correct. Can the same yeast be used to make wine? There is uh, there there is winemakers yeast that are really geared for the different varietals of wine. Um, I I don't think I'd want to try a brewer's yeast in in wine. What do you think it would be the difference? Um, I think it would not have as much flavor. It would not have as much as much aroma um, to it. So we've got our yeast going. We've got it in the jug. We've got it marked. We're ready to go. That's going to sit there for how long? Uh, seven to ten days. Um, I will take readings on it. So um, when, when we first start, before we add the yeast, I take a reading of the grape juice, and I find out how many, what the bricks are. And bricks are the amount of sugar in the, in the juice, which also gives you the alcohol potential. And then, um, and then as it ferments, it eats the yeast, eats the sugar, and, 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 and turns into alcohol. And when you get to a specific gravity of 1.0000, then I know that all the sugar is gone. And then we and then we we'll press then we we'll press the the grapes in our nylon stocking. Can you do, oh so you, you don't do the pressing until after they've already fermented? Then. Correct. Oh, if see, so, that red, reds you reds you 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 ferment with the skins because that, that sets the color. Right. Whites you take it off the skins and you just ferment the juice. Okay, so we're 10, 15 days into it mm -hmm. now, and then you do the pressing, which is squeezing all the juices out of the all, fruit right. that's in there. All by Has hand. Has the fruit been broken at all up until this point? Yes, when when it's it's picked and it's brought in these yellow lugs, they call them. There's about twenty five pounds of grapes on the vine, and there's a crusher destemmer that we put it through, and it breaks the grapes apart, takes the stems away, and then you, you end up with a, with a must. So it's a juice and skins and, and, and the seeds. So it's kind of a mushy mm -hmm. combination of stuff. Correct. When you get ready to start putting things Correct. in. Correct. Now, do you add sugar to, your, to those? Or is it all going to be natural from the grapes? It's all going to be natural as long as Mother Nature cooperates. We've had... Um, 2000 and either 11 or 12 it was a very rainy year and so the bricks were very low so we had to add sugar to bring the bricks up to because we want you want to have wine to have 12 to 13 percent alcohol mm -hmm. and um so and then we've, conversely we've had really hot dry and your bricks get up to 25 26 27 and it's and it's almost port and so we add oxygenate or acid acid Acidinated. There's a acidinated water. So we, we take the, the pH of the wine, bring the water to the same pH, and then dilute it so that we bring the bricks down so that you get your 12 to 13 percent alcohol. So you can control that alcohol level on any Correct. at any point. You can Correct. stop that that process at any time mm -hmm. when you get to the percentage that you want. Correct. You can add, so you add can, or you can so you can make it as as potential you know potent as you want it. So you can make brandy pretty easy then. Probably. Well, you'd have to distill it. Though. You'd have to distill it. Yeah, I, yeah I'm not. Process. Yeah, I'm not. I don't do that. Yeah. We don't keep a still in the backyard here, by the way. We're no. not in North Carolina. Right. That's correct. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but there are a lot of distilleries around, and I guess that they're probably making some cognacs and some brandies mm -hmm. uh, and and country. rums and yeah. you know, whiskeys. Whiskeys. We, yeah. we can go all the way on that stuff that's here right. in Virginia. That's right. Okay, so we've got our uh, our mush or must, right. you call it must. Must it's in it's in here and now it's ready to go it's uh, still fermenting mm -hmm. and when is now it, we break it up right so once it's once it's done then we put it in a in an nylon straining bag and I squeeze it by hand to get the juice out and then it goes into a carboy which is the the it's a food grade plastic container five there I have three gallon five gallon and six gallon containers um, you let it sit for a couple of days and all the because solids get through some of the you know some of the the, the right. yeast gets through the leaves right. get through and you let that you let that settle down and it forms a um, a sludge at the bottom and then you rack the wine off using a racking cane and and uh, you take all the wine off and get the sludge away and then you we add the we add oak to it and um, and then let it let it let it ferment so that we're talking about this sludge sometimes you'll see a little sediment in some wines mm -hmm. and if just in case you didn't know, something I learned not long ago, this little hole in the bottom of it, because there's a ridge on the inside, and that's to catch the sediment. Mm -hmm. And do you know what that hole is called? Uh, the bottom of the bottle. It's called a punt. A 
punt. P-U-N-T. Okay. I don't know why I know that, but I know that. So the punt is there to catch the sediment. Correct. So when you get a bottle of wine, you don't want to shake it up. No. In fact, it should never be shaken. Correct. Poured Correct. slowly. Poured gently, yes. Gently. gently, yes. Now, we've got our wine. We've got everything ready. How long is it going to sit in that place before you're ready to bottle? I let it sit for about a year. I'll rack it. Um, a couple of times, just meaning I, t I just use a siphon and take it out, any sediment, get rid of the sediment, uh, and then I'll, I, I, I put it back into the funnels, which kind of aerates the wine and kind of helps it breathe a little bit. Um, also, in, after about a month, I add, um, I do a secondary uh, fermentation, which is a malolactic fermentation. And what that does is it's a bacteria that we add in that takes the malic acid that's naturally found in grapes, which is a bitter tasting, and it converts it to lactic acid, which is a much smoother, and that takes three or four months and as, it, as it's aging. Do you have to keep an eye on it during that aging process? I, 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 there's, there are um, airlocks that to keep air from getting in, so I, I check those on a weekly basis just but to make sure. the fermentation process is stopped. The aging, the, the fermentation process is stopping and then it's aging. Um, and I'll do it through there. I, I, I look at them once a week to make sure that the, the, the fermentation traps still have um, stuff in them so that they keep the airlock out. And then every couple of months, every three months, I'll rack it and put it, and put it back. Just, just keep, just babysit a little mm -hmm. bit. Yep. And now we get down to uh, time to bottle. Correct. And that looks, uh, it's not a real big process, is it? Well, no, but what you, what, you've, what you didn't see was we taste all the wine and then we blend it. So nothing, so Cab Sauv may have 8 or 10% of Merlot in it just because it helps enhance the flavor. Maybe it, it, if the Cab Sauv is lacking back-end finish, I'll, I'll put a different wine and try different wines to try and just kind of give, you know, so you get a, 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 an aroma, a nose up front, a nice smooth taste, and then a nice, nice finish. So, so most of your stuff is blended wines. A, li a little bit. If, you know, um, I'm not sure the percentage that, but you have to keep, you have to keep it certain percent pure to call it a Merlot. But you can add five, six, seven, eight percent of another wine to, um, to, and still call it, and still call it a Merlot or, or right. whatever the varietal is. Wow. Now, comparing the varieties of wine that we have here in Virginia and com to California, because I guess that's probably the standard for wine in the world right now. I was in mm -hmm. France and people were, they found out we had lived in L.A. and they wanted to know if we brought wine for them <laughs> in France. <laughs> okay. And uh, they love our wines here and vice versa. What makes Virginia such a good place for wineries? We have a lot of them here. We do. We do. Um, you know, the the... I think that the Virginia climate is a, is a really nice growing climate because you can get from late March to September of, of good weather. It's, it's hot. Um, it's not super wet. Um, the soil is decent. Um, you know, and, and what's, what, what I find interesting is, is a lot of um, vineyards are, they're growing grapes on their estate, but then they're buying land over the Chesapeake Bay or in other areas of Virginia that have a little bit different climate so they can grow a little bit different grapes. You know, Viognier and Cap Franc do really well here. Um, but then if they go to the coast, you know, the, the, by the Chesapeake Bay, they get to, they get other, other, other varietals grow better there. So they're, they're kind of experimenting around the, the climate of Virginia to come up with better Better grapes. Well, it's something you mentioned a little earlier. At the beginning of the Virginia wine industry, most people were buying their grapes from the same places until their vineyards grew up. So all Correct. the wines were pretty much kind, the same. Kind of tasted the same. And now are I think... Getting, are we getting uh, individual wine flavors now from different vineyards now? Yeah, yeah, we are. And I think over the next five years, uh, that'll, even, that'll even get better because, um, you know, from the time you plant a grape vine... It takes three years before you really can start getting any fruit, and it takes five to six years before they mature. So the guys that came in in 2012, 2013, 14 that have planted their grapes, in the next couple of years are going to start being, being mature, and it'll be the lion's share of what, they're, of what they're doing. Are they buying those cuttings? Are those coming from California come, and from France and all over the world? They come from, most of them, yeah, most of them come from California, uh -huh. and you, um, you have to test your soil because there's dozens of rootstocks 
And so you pick the root that goes best with the soil that you have. And then they, the, out in California, the nurseries, they, they graft the rootstock onto your, onto your, onto your grape because you can't, you can't take a Cab Sauve or a Cab Franc grape rootstock and plant it here as Thomas Jefferson learned and they all die. So they've learned how to do the grafting. So when you plant, so, so when you plant the grapes, they come bare rooted and there's like a graft bulb on it and you just have to make sure that stays a couple inches above the ground so that it doesn't try and side root itself and and then your grapes will be fine. Well, it's not grandpa's recipe anymore. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> the science of it is amazing. <clears throat> it is. There's well, a lot of science. You can also get degrees in in uh, wine making from all the universities now. Yeah, UC, UC Davis in California is is the it's the primo that's place. Where, that's where to go to learn. That's where to go to learn. Yep. I prefer a little place about 40 miles outside of Paris. It's uh... <laughs> The views are better. Yes. <laughs> so is the cheese. <laughs> So now we've gotten to the point, uh, we've, we're ready to go, we're, we're bottling slowly, one at a time, very meticulous. Correct. Everything's pre-measured, everything's right. It's got, it's, a we, use a, we use a bottling tube that has a fill, a, a bottling, a fill that when you, due to pressure on the bottom of the bottle, it releases the wine. And then when the bottle's full, when you, when you pull the, the racking tube out, that displaces and gives you the, the head space, the for, head space for the bottle. Then, you, then we cork it, and then... Um, and then what we do is, because we hand cork them, I turn everything on its side and let it sit for a day. So if there's any leaks, I can find out. If I have to recork anything, I can, I, I, I'd rather do that than once the capsules go on and have it leak here, because that would be really bad. And then, um, and then once it once it's sets for a day, then we put the, we put the capsules on like we showed um, one at a time, and then, we, and then we put the labels on. And, and then, the reason for the caps... Decoration. That's all it is. Does it have anything to do with uh, the cork absorbing wine and getting absorbed and possibly? You know, there's, there's places that, that they don't put them on. I just like them. I, I, I use each year, I use a different color so that I can at a glance tell what my oldest wine is so that I can use that first. Sure. So, so if you're, if you're going to go to a wine <coughs> store and look for a wine, uh, what are the things we're going to look for? Well, number one, the, the variety that we want. So Correct. we pick a Cabernet Sauvignon or a beautiful Merlot or whatever that you make here. And but it has a screw top on it. Is that kind of a wine I want to stay away from? Do I want no. something that's traditional corked, or is that going to make a difference? In today's in today's day and age, the the, the screw top is becoming more and more acceptable. Um, it's certainly cheaper. It is. It is. It is cheaper. Um, for, for them because they don't need the corks. And they don't need all all the, all the natural corks or, or the synthetic corks. Um, I'm still an old, I'm, I'm an old fashioned guy, so. We like the cork. I like the corks, yeah. yeah. Those corks, by the way, come from Portugal, I believe. That's uh, the big thing there. They export those things all over the world, big sheets of it that go all over the world. Well, that's interesting. So we're now we're down to the wine and we've got it sitting out here and it's aging. Now, oh, that, let me go back to that. The aging <coughs> process, because that's going to last several months, almost a year. Correct. Right. Where do I want to put it? Do I want to set? It? I don't want to set it on the back porch. No, no. I, it, it, wine likes constant temperature, and it likes dark. And so, I have a under my under the closet under my stairs, and I just I just stuff it all back in there and turn the lights out. Turn the lights out. Yep, and it stays. It's it's a little warmer. I mean, wine likes to be sixty to sixty five when it when it, I mean, I'm I'm maybe sixty five to sixty eight, but oh well. What level from year to year? Now, you've been doing this for about seven years now. Correct. What level of changes do you make every year? Do you find things that you've learned that you can do something a little different to change your flavors? Or do you, do you pretty much stick with what you know? I pretty much stick with what I know. The grapes change every year because they're never the same bricks. So there's always a little bit more alcohol, a little bit less alcohol. Um, you know, some years are very good growing years. Some are iffy um so that so i could take the same and do everything exactly the same from last year to this year and the merlot is going to taste different from each year so well i thought it was interesting too you mentioned because if you have a real rainy season you have less sugar in the grapes correct and so if it's a dry season then you'll have sweeter grapes correct okay i didn't know that now let's get down to the good part okay. the drinking part all right now when we take a look at this what do we look for 
when we're looking at a, a new wine. Now, this is a brand new wine, so it's just been bottled in the last few days. Correct. But past few hours, actually. Past few hours. It's fresh. It's really fresh. Yeah. But we really want it to have a little time to rest, though. Correct. Uh, usually, when I, after I bottle, I, I like to let them sit in the bottles till Christmas, just so to kind of let it. A couple of months. A couple of months, yeah. Now, once we've done that, and we see people looking at it up into the, into the light, what am I looking for? I, well, when I look up, I'm looking, I'm looking at A, at color. And a lot of times, I like to put it up against a white sheet of paper just so that you can see the color of the wine. Um, you'll see people swirl. Swirl. You know, and that, no, that's doing a couple things. One, it's, a, it's, it's aerating it, kind of get, and that'll help make up the flavor. Yeah, and it'll help a, a newer wine kind of feel a little older because you, you get the air into it. Um, and then there's also, you can, when you, there's, it's called legs. Right. And so you watch the, you can watch the, it run down the side of the glass. And um, I'm not really sure. Um, that's relative to sugar content, though, isn't it? I believe that's true. I'm just, uh, that, I, I just, I just smell and swirl and drink. like what I like and drink what I drink. Yep. So if you go to a winery and you do this, they will think you know all about it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but the truth is in the flavor. There are many $50 bottles of wine that are no better than a $5 bottle of wine. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Wine is not determined by cost. It's determined by quality. Right. And, and, your, and your personal taste. Your personal taste. Yeah. You know, there, there are some people that love Cap Franc and because of the black pepper finish. But other people... Don't, can't stand it because of the black pepper finish. Well, yours has been good. Everyone I've tried has been amazing. Well, thank you. Also, because we're in Virginia, since we're talking about varieties in Virginia, if you go further south to North Carolina and their wine industry, they're mostly white wines down there. Correct. They a lot of and, muscat and a lot of yes, muscadine wines. Muscadine and sweet wines. Scuppernong. Uh, we, yes. We, we, we did a wine tasting one time in Myrtle Beach, and it was like tasting syrup. Yeah. It was, it just, you know, I just, we just weren't fans. Um, it was funny. We had a, we had to, um, we purchased a tasting and a glass of wine. And there was like eight or nine wines. And about the seventh wine, we were both panicked trying to figure out, we have to get a glass of one of these. And we weren't sure which one we were going to get. <laughs> yeah. So, but again, it's, but it's, it's taste. It's, it's personal preference. But the sweeter the wine, the, the lower the alcohol content. Hmm. If you take no, a, not not necessarily, because you can, because you can still, because um, there's to, to get sweet wine. There's two different ways to do it. You can, you can start with your regular grapes and ferment it down to where you get to two or three percent sugar left, and then crash and stop the fermentation. Mm -hmm. And then there's that's less alcohol. Or you can let it go to dry. And then, and then back sweeten it with, with sugar. So you'll still have the alcohol content, but then you can bring the, the sweetness up. Now that brings us up to another point. Dry wine as opposed to... Sweet wine? Sweet wine or dry wine. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. It's not sweet or sour. It's sweet right, or dry. Sweet or dry. Right. right. So sweet. And I've noticed just looking at alcohol contents in the store, they're usually about 9 to 10%. And then the, th the things that get a little drier are usually 11 to 13%. Mm -hmm. So, a little so dry, a little right, has right. A, drier wine has more alcohol in it normally. Okay, sounds good to you. <laughs> sounds good to me. So, like I know what I'm talking about, doesn't it? <laughs> Does. <laughs> well, wine is a wonderful thing. It's been around since the beginning of time. One of the first things that happened when Noah came out of the ark was he started growing grapes, and as yep. usual, it got him into trouble too. <laughs> yes, yes, it did. <laughs> Moderation. Moderation. Moderation and enjoy the craft of it. Correct. I and mean, it's a wonderful thing, this wine, and, and from all over the world. And every state in the Union has wineries. Every state in mm -hmm. America, in the United mm -hmm. States, has wineries. Right. Some better than others. But uh, I'm telling you right here, Lake of the Woods is a place I like to go. I keep saying that because we're sitting here with glasses of wine. That's right. Um, now, you can't, you don't sell your wine. No. You can, it, Virginia allows you to make. 100 gallons a year for personal consumption. And uh, I do about between three and 400 bottles. So I'm at the 60, 70, 80 gallon a year. Um, the, um, 
the, the, the licensing process is quite extensive, and mm -hmm. I'd rather not do that. But you don't have to do licensing for, for, for your own consumption? Not for personal consumption, right. Okay, now I'm a brand new guy. I love the idea. I've been a wine connoisseur for a long time, but I want to start making my own. Well, how do I start? Lots of reading, lots of research. Um, there's a lot of stuff written out there. Um, if you can find, if you can volunteer to, at a local winery um, and help out, get to know the winemaker, kind of just follow them along, pick up different things. You know, they love free labor. Where um, do I get my Where do I get my equipment? How do I get empty bottles and corks and and all the things that I'm going to need? Where do I get all that stuff? Internet. Uh, I use, um, there's two or three places that I use, uh, Midwest Supplies out of uh, Minneapolis. And they have all, everything that a person would need. Everything that you need. From the okay, oak so spirals to the carboys to the wrecking canes. And we everything. didn't talk about oak spirals. That's something you showed me outside. We'll take a look at those too. And oak spiral is, uh, is this long, right. really sure. gig kind of thing. Correct. Here, we'll, we'll have it magically oh, appear. Here we go. One of our production assistants has graciously brought it. This is <laughs> so these are oak spirals. Um, they, um, these are French oak, medium plus toast. And so one of these goes into a carboy, and I don't need which to put, the big jug. which is the big, the big clear jugs. And I don't, and that will do all the aging. So it's just like I've put it in an oak barrel, but I don't have to have the oak barrel. And you can get different kinds of. You can get toast. <clears throat> These things are, are burnt or They're, charred on the inside. And the, and the more and, and and some people like lighter toast. Some you know just the way the flavor of the wine. I've I've not experimented with with the toasting of it. I've always done the medium just because it's middle of the road and it's a good place to start. Well, that's why Chardonnay is a Chardonnay. Also, it always has that real smoky kind of aftertaste mm -hmm. to it because it's been in a charred barrel or used one of those. But also now what they've also been doing is with Chardonnay is they do it in stainless steel. So they'll do some in oak and some in, in Chardonnay, or some Chardonnay in stainless. So you'll have in the stainless, it'll be a crisper, uh, brighter finish, whereas the Chardonnay in the will be more of a buttery, a creamier finish. So it's and, 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 and people and and folks are well, actually, they kind of they blend them together or they'll keep them apart. And most. It's almost like 50-50, split down the middle. Some like the crisp, some like the butter. Personal preference. Now, grapes are not the only thing you can make wine from either, is it? Uh, no. I have made blackberry wine. Uh, we picked blackberries and froze them and then crushed them up and added water to them and then treated them like, a, like um, with a fruit, a fruit yeast. And then I blended that with um, Merlot and sweetened it to 6% and made a dessert wine, which... If you soak fruit in it and then make crepes and put it in, really good. <laughs> well, this is crying out for prime rib right now. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, and, then, and then there's another varietal that we use, is, which is Petit Verdot. And one of our favorite things to do with Petit Verdot is you, make the, you get the Costco Giardelli brownies. And instead of the water, you put the wine in. So, it oh. gets, so the alcohol goes away, but you get the Petit Verdot flavor. And those are kind of yummy. Making brownies with wine. Yeah. Ooh, I got a feeling that's going to be on one Stick of our cooking Stick with me. Shows. I, I'll, I'll corrupt you. <laughs> That'll be on one of our cooking shows. It sounds like something we need to do, Hannah. <laughs> this afternoon, in fact. Wow. Well, that, that, it's, it's, fascinating. Uh, it's a fascinating hobby. It's a fascinating art and craft. Uh, there's a lot of people who make wine around the country. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, a different thing. We had a fellow that we knew in California that made rosehip wine from rose hips. Interesting. And he was making tangerine. And he actually made a tomato wine. Ew. That's what I thought. Yeah. Now, I've, done, I've done blackberry. I do apple. I make an apple. I use um, bulk um, apple cider and then add about a gallon or a, a, a pound of sugar per gallon to get the bricks up to 12 or 13 and then and ferment it. Um, that's the only quote unquote white wine that I can that I make because the the white wines need um, when they ferment they generate a lot of heat and heat is bad for a white wine so I don't have the refrigeration I don't have jacketed tanks and all that stuff to do right. that so hey this is good enough what we have this well, works I thank for me you, I thank you so much for this education we've had today an opportunity to answer some of my questions and and I've learned a lot from it and I'm sure that you have folks out there as well. And you just never know who your neighbor's going to be. But I thank you for taking the time you and sharing for inviting us into your home and, and sharing a sure. part of your hobby our and pleasure. your passion as well. 
Thanks. And uh, I know that we're going to enjoy it. In fact, we're enjoying it right now. I want to remind you that there's all kinds of good stuff to do around here at Lake of the Woods, and there are wine tastings as well as wineries in our general area. Now, you can't get any of Ken's unless you know him well and are good friends. Correct. Fortunately, their list is short now. Hopefully, we've been added to it. Cheers. Cheers to you, too. We'll see you again on another Meet Your Neighbor. This is Norm Allen with you, hoping you'll join us again right here on TV 18, Life Around the Lake, where the story's all about you. This is Michael from Red, White, Blue and Brew, your neighborhood shop for beer, wine and cheese. We love TV 18 and life around the lake. Hi, I'm Melissa. Darlene. We're from Low Hair Studio. I love TV 18. And we love life around the lake. <laughs>